Let us now look at substance, or MEI, which is one of our seven forces of organization. The content of the substance, or MEI, section includes the following. We are going to discuss why substance is important in business, what some of the problems with substance are. Then we look at key concepts and systemic guiding principles of substance and the redesign and management of substance. Why is substance important to business? Well, first of all, what is substance in business? It refers to resources, our infrastructure, our tools, our human resources, and also uh, the elements of the product and services, the ingredients, the materials, the information that goes into our product and services. So if we have an organization that has better resources than its competitors, they are likely to be more competitive, also more creative, innovative, and also more economical. So, for example, better equipment can make an organization more economical, like many organizations experienced when they shifted to automated production or incorporating the latest technologies into the organization can make a, a huge difference to the organization. For example, an online presence, online selling has transformed many organizations, including our own, where we shifted from face-to-face -face learning to e-learning. Also, more knowledge that is accumulated in an organization will make the organization more innovative and ahead of its competitors. So knowledge management is an important aspect of a substance management in an organization. Likewise, better trained human resources will perform better, will generate better ideas, contribute to an innovative development of the organization as well as delivering better service. If you're looking at products and the substance of products and services, organizations with better quality inputs as well as better outputs and better quality of processing are likely to be preferred by their customers. For example, to use better inputs will improve the output. My favorite coffee shop has been sold and the cakes and coffee deteriorated because they changed the ingredients. Immediately the customers kept away. If one produces or processes the products and services differently, for example sloppy processing of data in a bank or in an insurance company, will make the organization less competitive or if the output is of lesser quality. If the quality control of what goes into product services is poor, it can be very damaging to the organization. So managing the substance of the organization is hugely important to business. Typically, substance or meta-energy information related problems um, the insufficient quantity and quality of resources in an organization and that refers to the processing resources, the structure resources like the acting and support structure and also the governance resources like managers for example. Then there would be competition for limited resources in many organizations competing for limited financial resources or human resources. There could be wrong allocation of resources. Maybe some business units get too much staff or money, others get too little. And there could be wrong utilization of resources that information or tools or systems are used wrongly or in the wrong context. This section deals with key concepts and systemic guiding principles of substance. What is substance? Well, everything in the universe, every system has substance. This makes 
the thing or the system perceptible, observable to our senses and also to our measuring devices and our technological equipments. If we couldn't perceive a thing, if it would have no substance, it wouldn't exist. Substance is composed of MEI that stands for matter, material things, energy, and information. And these MEI occur together and form a field, and we call that the MEI field. So, for example, if we have an MEI field, a material thing, like an artifact, the table, for example, it is material, it has matter, it also has energy, kinetic energy, but also in its inner environment, the uh, molecules and atoms hold together through energy, and the table has information embedded in it. Somebody has given some thought why the table looks like this and hasn't got another shape. Likewise, if you're looking at an MEI field, for example, electricity. Although electricity is about energy, we need some material, conductors, generators, and equipment to use the energy. And of course, all that involves a lot of information as well. If our thing is an MEI field, an information thing, and it's all about information, like an idea, for example, it still needs material substance, like neurons in the brain and energy, electrochemical processes in the brain, to be generated, to be perceived, to be processed. So whenever we see matter, energy, or information, we know that the other elements have to be present as well in different proportions. The graphic depiction of substance is a gray MEI dot. It symbolizes the interaction of matter, energy, information, and that they give rise to some solid gray shape. If you're looking at an activity system and the types of substances that are embedded in an activity system or that make up an activity system, we can distinguish, first of all, the processing MEI. That is the input MEI that goes into our process. For example, the ingredients to the cake, if we stay with that previously mentioned example. We have throughput MEI, that is the different semi-finished products, the semi-assemblies, or in our cake example, the dough and the half-baked cake and the glaze, etc. Then we have output MEI. That is the product or service itself, like uh, the cake or the car or the plan, and byproducts that can be pollutants, that can be waste, that can be confusion in the context of information things. Then we have structure, MEI, or structure substance, that's our acting substance. In the cake example, it's the person doing the cake, or if we have a cake factory, the automats that do the mixing and pouring and baking. Then we have the support MEI, our human resources, our knowledge that supports the acting, our tools, our infrastructure. And we also have governance MEI. That can be knowledge, information, the recipes, guiding rules of how to do the processing. It can also be the governors, the managers, the leaders, or it can be equipment like a control panel. If you're looking at the different types of substance that we have got in the whole organization in each of its activity systems, and we want to look more generically at how can we manage the substance that we have in an organization, it could be useful to group it. Typically, the resources of an organization include human resources, material resources, energy resources, technological resources, knowledge resources, and financial resources.
financial resources is the master substance with which we can procure any of the other substances. So to develop the substance in an organization, it's useful to work with broader groups and to consider how can we improve each of those groups of substances. What strategies can we use to improve them, to develop them, to build capacity, etc. We're looking now at systemic guiding principles of substance, or MEI. The first is that systems have a physical reality, that is the reality of substance that we observe, the meta-energy information fields that we observe, and they also have a conceptual reality, that is the reality that informs the physical reality. The graphic representation of physical reality is the gray MEI dot, that we have discussed before. It shows the field of matter energy information that we observe in physical reality. In fact, anything we observe in physical reality is a combination of matter energy information. If it wouldn't have some kind of substance, we couldn't observe it. And this is represented by the gray dot. The conceptual reality is depicted by an orange ethos dot. We have already discussed the ethos before, and we have defined it as the field of information, of values and guiding principles that informs, puts form into physical reality. In module one, we have also talked about the web of the biomatrix, the activity and entity systems that we observe in the universe, and that science seems to observe that we have an information field behind those manifested systems in reality. So the ethos is the specific information field around one of those systems that we observe. So the conceptual reality is the information reality of the system that we observe. Both the physical and conceptual reality are real. What we mean by real here is that the physical reality is real in terms of its existence, the substance that we can observe, but behind that substance is a conceptual reality that is also real, but it is real in conceptual space. For example, if I observe a house in physical reality, the house I'm sitting in, I know that the house was built on the basis of a plan. So the plan is the conceptual reality, the information reality of that particular house. I also know that the plan was drawn on the basis of some ideas of one or more persons. So the idea is the conceptual reality of the plan. And if you have an idea about a house, we have the house in conceptual reality. And the physical reality will unfold according to that conceptual reality. In other words, the two realities are linked. The conceptual reality informs, puts form into the physical reality. We call it feed forward and that is what we normally do in planning. We can also link physical reality and conceptual reality, whereby physical reality gives feedback, indicating feedback, if the conceptual reality has actually been manifested. So we can evaluate the manifestation of the house and can check if it was built according to the conceptual reality. This is what we do in performance management. 
We plan, in other words, we have a conceptual reality of our production or service delivery, then we implement that, and then we check the physical outcome of what we have planned and evaluate if it was indeed done according to conceptual reality. Likewise, when we do an ideal design of an organization or of an artifact, or of any other system, that ideal design will inform the way physical reality unfolds and we can then check if physical reality is indeed approximating what we have planned in terms of conceptual reality. If the two realities differ from each other, very often we will have a problem. So problem solving and problem dissolving aligns the two realities. That is really the purpose of uh, problem solving and problem dissolving. The difference between the two is that problem solving aligns physical reality according to conceptual reality. For example, if my car breaks down, then I will identify what doesn't work in physical reality according to how the car is designed. We'll fix the physical reality according to the design of the car and it will work again. We have solved the problem. We have aligned physical reality according to conceptual reality. If we observe that there are lots of problems in physical reality, as we often do as a management consultant when we come into an organization, we identify a lot of problems in a lot of areas, and we may ask if we do have an appropriate conceptual reality that could inform our organizational behavior. Do we have the right plans? Do we have the right designs? Uh, many social systems have the problem of not having an appropriate conceptual reality or that a lot in conceptual reality is unconscious and not necessarily desirable. So if that is the case, we will need to do an ideal design for our system. And once we have changed the conceptual reality by making an ideal design. It informs physical reality in a different way and physical reality gets transformed. So transformation of a system always requires that we are making a change in the conceptual reality of the system. We can also have information arising from physical reality that changes conceptual reality. So physical reality can also inform conceptual reality. For example, if we renovate our house according to the plan we have got, we may get a better idea as we look at the physical space that we think maybe we should change the plan. So interacting with the physical reality gave us a better idea and we change conceptual reality. Also, when we talk about the laws of nature, which are the conceptual reality that uh, underlies nature, the conceptual reality of the values and guiding principles according to which natural systems seem to function, this is information that arose from physical reality. We surmise conceptual reality on the basis of physical reality. So in other words, physical reality informs the creation of the conceptual reality that we call the body of science. And then that in turn allows us or indicates if we really have the right conceptual reality according to physical reality. As soon as we observe phenomena in physical reality that do not match our scientific theories, then we know that we have the wrong conceptual reality of nature and uh, we must do some more research. 
Another guiding principle of substance is that during processing the MEI fields split up and are transformed into some kind of new MEI. We have learned about that already in the process section. So if we are taking our ingredients of the cake, we are breaking them up, the eggs and the butter from the paper and so on, recombining them and we are getting new MEI fields, our cake. Now this process involves both energy we are mixing things and we are heating the dough and it needs information. We must know what we are doing. So it is almost a magical process of having the transformation of MEI happening. Of course, if we don't know what we are doing or if we are using too little or wrong energy, then the process will not work out as we intended to. Now, another principle that is very important is that I, the information aspect of the MEI field, is synergistic. What we mean by that is that if we are taking information and sharing it with each other, we are creating new information that was not there before or before we started sharing the information. Now compared to material substance, the molecules and atoms that get split up and recombined are finite. No new uh, substance is created, but in the information domain, new substance, new information substance is created. It is synergistic by definition. Compared to a material thing, if I'm sharing my cake, one piece of cake I give to you, I keep the other, I have less, you have more. The cake doesn't get more in sharing. But if we exchange cooking recipes, then we can come up with new cooking recipes that neither you nor I knew. So the material aspect is finite while the information aspect is synergistic. We need to utilize the synergistic effect of information to improve our systems and in an organization we obviously do that through organizational learning. There are other ways how we can use it. We can add information to our resources, we can automate our machines or we can train our people. So we increase the capacity of what we have got by adding information. And this is what has happened in technological evolution in the recent period of history, where a technological innovation or a technological development moved from material-based technologies to energy-based technologies to what we have now information-based technologies. And it is quite interesting to have a bit of a look at that. For example, in the agricultural age, the pre-industrial age, so to speak, we had MEI technologies. In other words, there were material technologies, we called them implements, like the plow or the hog or the cart, and the energy and information was provided from outside the technology. So there was very limited work we could do because we had to do the work as a human being or maybe uh, we employed some animals. In the industrial age, what in fact ushered in the industrial age was the development from MEI technologies to MEI technologies. In other words, energy was now embodied in the technology and the technology could do the work. We call that the machine. So it's not the human being or the animal that does the work, it's the machine itself that does the work because energy is embodied in the machine. And as a result, we can do a lot of production, but because information is still coming from outside the technology, it is standardized production. That is why the industrial age was so concerned with mass production. 
the famous statement by Henry Ford, you can have any color of car you want as long as it is black, because that was the standardized color at which the production line uh, was set. The reality of mass production in the economy generally ushered in an era of mass thinking. We had mass democracy, mass education, mass media, and what it really meant is standardized. So our education system was standardized. Every child had it to go through exactly the same. We had the standardized media and everything was driven by economies of scale. Obviously, the more mass we could produce, the cheaper every additional unit became. As we moved into the information age, what changed was that I, the information, got embodied in the technology, and we call that the automat. We have now machines, so to speak, who have information embedded and can change quickly, giving rise to customized production. While I believe it took 100,000 or so units of car production before one made a profit, the automated production lines can be changed after something like 10 to 20 units and still remain profitable. So a new era of customization started. More than that, the embodiment of the eye in the technology gives rise to new realities because of its synergistic effect that we hadn't dreamt of. I think the World Wide Web is probably one of the best examples how it has changed our life and we had no idea that that could happen. Similar when we start manipulating the information content of nature, as for example in genetic engineering, we are changing the information content and as a result change the system, but we are not always anticipating the effect that is going to have because information is synergistic and as such not predictable. So the information technologies have changed all aspects of social life and also of the economy. Now, one of the interesting shifts is that material things are scarce, while information things have the problem of being abundant. So our economic paradigms work on the basis of scarcity, that every new unit is being produced is less valuable than the previous one is one of the economic laws we have. Now, if that were true, then the information modules like uh, Bill Gates would be very, very poor. Exactly the opposite is taking place, that every additional unit being produced of an information bit becomes more valuable because it needs to be used by others as well. So there are different ways of looking at the economy now and different ways of looking at society. So if we come with our scarcity mentality of not sharing, of especially not sharing information in organizations because we could lose power, as some people think, then we are operating from an old paradigm and we are not creating the synergies that we should be creating in alliances with our stakeholders, for example. In fact, one of the key competitive advantages of the information age is synergy. And synergy does not happen if we work from an old outdated paradigm. So outdated paradigms are jeopardizing the competitiveness of an organization. Now having said that, whenever there is a new paradigm, the previous paradigm is still operative, but as a special case. So there are definitely also areas in our business where we must think scarcity and where we must think competitiveness. But we need to distinguish when that mindset is appropriate and when the sharing mindset, the abundant mindset, 
the aligning with stakeholder mindset and that includes even aligning with the competition in order to achieve mutually beneficial outcomes. So we need to know when which paradigm is appropriate. Let us uh, compare the scarce and abundant substance in a little more detail. We have said in the previous section that material substance, the MEI fields are scarce. Likewise, energy is scarce, not per se, but if energy is generated through material resources, it is scarce, while information resources are abundant. So material resources are finite and because of being finite, they are scarce. While information substances, information is infinite. There are infinite possibilities to generate new and information in general is abundant. And we see that very clearly nowadays with the information that is available on the World Wide Web and is growing exponentially. Material substance diminishes with sharing. If I share my piece of land or my cake with you, then I have less. So they get diminished. And what happens in a situation of scarcity, there is competition for these scarce resources. Either I have the land or you have the land. Either I have more or you have more. So that is a zero-sum game. There's only so much property available and then one of the competing party gets more or another gets less. By comparison, information substance increases with sharing. So the information, if shared, increases. I am not losing my information of system thinking if I'm sharing it with you. You gain it, you may add it to what you have got already. So to have that happening, uh, we need to be willing to share and we need to be willing to cooperate. From a mindset point of view, this is completely different than the competition for scarce resources, which is unwilling to share, which even prevents sharing. So material substance is governed by a conflict of possession. So the conflict is about who is going to possess the finite resources. By comparison, the conflict in the context of information substance is one of understanding, that there's a different interpretation of the conflict, different information is regarded as right or wrong, true or false, and there's conflict around that. Material resources have a fixed form, they develop in a relatively fixed way, a plant grows in a particular way, a person develops over time in a relative fixed way, planets develop in a fixed form, and moreover that form deteriorates over time as a result of the law of entropy. By comparison, information substance is changing and synergistic. Information changes in every new context. It morphs and if shared and intermingles with other information, it is synergistic, meaning it gives rise to new information that wasn't there before. It assumes a new form. So it is creative as well as transformative. We refer to that as negantropic. Redesigning and managing substance involves the following. Compile all processing, acting, supporting and governance MEI. In other words, make a list of all MEI that is being processed, that is doing the processing, like the acting MEI, and that supports it, and also the resources associated with the governance. And then categorize those into related categories. Put all human, material, energy, knowledge, and so on, MEI together. And then take each category and consider it from the point of view of availability in terms of both quantity and quality. 
and then design guidelines or strategize improvements for the procurement of each group of resources, the development of each group of resources, and also look at the multiple use of the various resources belonging to each subcategory. The multiple use of resources would imply that the system can do more with less resources. Tools for managing substance include better procurement of better new resources. It could also involve growing and developing one's own resources in a business. This is often referred to as capacity building. One of the best ways of building capacity is adding information or informationizing our resources, making them intelligent. As I have mentioned earlier, we are building I information into the MEI technology. So it, this is what we mean by informationizing. We are making our machines, our materials, as well as our human beings more intelligent. We can also use the resources in multiple ways. We are talking about doing more with less here. One way is sharing of resources where they are most needed. So we are taking our scarce resources and we are deploying them selectively where needed. For example, organizations that manage many different types of projects send their experts at critical points in a project phase to different projects. So they are sharing their resources or staff shares knowledge, shares tools, etc. We can also use the same resource for different functions. We can use our training center for training, but we can also use it as a party center once in a while. Or we can use our expert who is uh, doing our project work to also mentor colleagues and upskill them at the same time or uh, develop their capacity. So the worker is used for doing the work as well as for mentoring and doing the training while doing the work. One can also embody different functions into a resource. The typical example is the cell phone. We can phone with it and SMS with it, but we can also use it as a personal organizer, as a camera, accessing the internet, as an alarm clock, etc. Let us now look at the application of substance or meta-energy information in an activity and entity system. If we look at the application of substance or MEI in an activity system, we can identify three types of substance. The one is the processing substance, that would be the inputs, products, and byproducts, or if you want to be very accurate, the inputs, throughputs, products, and byproducts that flow through the activity system. The second type of substance is the substance associated with the structure, both the acting structure and the support structure. And the third type of substance is associated with the governance substance or governance MEI that consists of governance acting and support substance as well as processing substance. So for example, if you're going back to our cake baking experience, the processing MBI would be the ingredients and the various stages of the dough and then uh, the cake and the decorating of the cake and so on. The structure MEI would be uh, the person doing the cake and uh, the tools and uh, the counters and kitchen and fridge and so on that supports the process. The governance MEI would be also the person doing the cake who controls how long the cake should be in the oven, how long we need to mix the cake and so on. And there is support MEI, like a recipe, how we need to go about it. 
and uh, also the processing MEI that uh, one looks for information, for example, the temperature of the oven. If we consider substance from the perspective of an entity system, then we would group all activity substance and maybe we would group it in a different way. Uh, for example, into human knowledge, technological, material, energy, financial, etc. substance, which in an organizational context we usually call resources. The reason why we do that is that we are looking uh, across the organization at the different types of substance and we can strategize how we can develop and improve the different categories of substance throughout the organization.